Welcome to Behind the Police, a production of iHeartRadio. Now I am become Pod, the destroyer of casts. Welcome back to Behind the Bastards. This is Robert Evans trying a trying a new style of introduction. Uh, this is actually Behind the Police, our special mini series in Behind the Bastards, where we talk about history's greatest bastards, American police. Uh, back with me for part five of this six-part series uh, is my Sheesh. co-host, Jason Petty, uh, better known as the hip-hop artist Propaganda. Jason, how you doing, man? What's up, man? Eating dried mangoes and listening to old DJ Scratch. Mm-hmm. And I hope that, like, I hope you got, I'm sorry, guys, I'm back, man. I'm, I'm here again. Thanks, God. Learning all the variants. Yeah, you're the first guest we've had for three straight weeks, or Look for here. two straight weeks, I think. Man, I, like, I'm getting, am I hitting, like, Billy Wayne, like, like, like zone, I mean, you, you, you know? you're hitting you're hitting propaganda zone. Um, yeah, I, I like that, man. My mm-hmm. own zone, like the P ozone. zone. It's yeah, the P like zone. those, like those, like those calzone things that they used to make at pizza. I think it was Pizza Hut, the Bazone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those were good as yeah. hell. Yeah, yo, can I? A quick joke about quick joke, not quick joke. Quick story about calzones. Absolutely, uh, necessary. And we can move on there. So, my homeboy Joseph Solomon. He's probably one of the most gorgeous men I've ever met. And uh, he's a caramel, six foot six, like soul singer, poet. It's ridiculous. It's not fair. You know, you ever meet the guy where it's like, it's just not fair. You shouldn't be. Yes. No one should be this beautiful. So that's Joe, right? Um, Joe lives in Atlanta. He was ordering this pizza or he's, he went to this spot, you know, it was during the quarantine, he wanted a calzone. And, you know, first of all, it's it's Atlanta. You know, this, let's be real. This this It's Chocolate City. He's black people, right? And the whole shop was black people. And he tries to get a calzone. And he could tell based on the way that the lady was looking at him that she ain't know what a calzone was, right? <laughs> so, so he, but she still was like pressed a few buttons on the screen. And then you could see her look back at the home. He's like, hey, hey, what's the, and right? And they kind of whisper it back and forth. You could tell somebody must have Googled a calzone. And then he finally gets it. And then stupid him didn't open the box till he got home and he opened the box and it was just a pizza folded in half. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is essentially Which is right. a calzone. That's the yeah. funny part. I was like, that is a calzone. But that he was like, you just folded a small pizza in half. What else do you want? I mean, really? You know what isn't like a calzone <laughs> prop? Uh, the American policing. Yes, the evolution of American policing. Okay in the 1900s is not very much like a folded pizza, uh, <sighs> thank, which is unfortunate. Thank the Lord above. What if that's how we handled law enforcement? What if when you had two feuding gangs, the government just sent calzones over and we're like, hey guys, yo, if you, you tried calzones? Some calzones, a little bit of barbecue, a couple of oh, hot yeah, wings. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like everybody just sit down. Let's just have some calzones and some hot links. I think a good 70% of the problems of law enforcement, like instead of tear gassing a bunch of protesters, what if the state provided calzones? I'd be with it. Yeah, and it's cheaper too. I bet we'd save money on tear gas and such because you can buy, you can feed a lot of people calzones for the price of hundreds of tear gas canisters. Uh, Let me tell you something. And you know, it's less to clean up. You know what I mean? It's easier on the environment. Mm -hmm. Creates more jobs. Creates more jobs. I, mm-hmm. Look, we just pods over. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, uh, you know. Look forward you, to our new behind the calzone series. Behind once, the calzone. Once this idea of ours goes horribly wrong in a year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the calzone shot a kid. No, no, no one had ever seen anything like it. Pelted with a calzone from <laughs> yeah. a calzone. Yeah. All right. And we'd have to deal. With, okay. So, yeah. yeah sorry. Last week, we dug into the really, the very racist roots of U.S. policing, the KKK, Jim Crow, lynching, and the death penalty. And in doing so, we kind of took a break from the broader history of how police have evolved in this country and focused on, like, the enabling of white supremacy and the suppression of black people as an integral part of the justice system. Mm-hmm. And today, we're going to kind of peel back out again to discuss how the broader system of policing evolved in the U.S. over the last century to bring us to where we are now, uh, which is, you know, police stop. Stopping random people for no reason, doing horrific violence to them, uh, and then being shielded from consequences by police unions. So that's what we're going to explain today. Okay. Cool. 
Yeah, there it is. This will be fun. We're going to talk a lot about police unions and a lot about uh, stop and frisk and broken windows. Okay, yeah. So those two, stop and frisk gets to like my life. Yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, to get to that point, uh, we have to you know zoom back a bit to the start of the 20th century. Uh, by okay. the time this nation started entering, you know what most people would call the modern era, most police departments were de facto the enforcement arm of organized crime, in the words of one scholar. So cops existed. We talked about this in episode two. Cops existed as muscle for for criminal, for like gang leaders and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Police departments engaged in constant election fraud because their jobs were generally tied to the position of local political bosses who were also gangsters. Okay. Uh, And during this period, this is like Tammany Hall and shit. And during this period, police drew salaries, but there was no such thing as overtime and their salaries were generally shit. So instead, they took a lot of bribes. Dr. Gary Potter, who's a historian of law enforcement, insists that it's actually wrong to call the police in this period corrupt. He writes... Quote, they were, in fact, primary instruments for the creation of corruption in the first place. So, like, the police Whoa. aren't corrupt. The police create corruption in this period, Whoa. which is an interesting but I think really important distinction to make. That yeah. is meta, bro. Like, yeah. I actually took a second, like, yeah. dang. Yeah. I need to lean back from that one for a little bit. Like, that's... Yeah. That is profound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Harry yeah. Potter doesn't mince fucking words. At all. Um, yeah. So in the early 1900s, police departments in major major cities, particularly in the eastern seaboard, but also Chicago, because Chicago is a Midwestern city, but we all kind of lump it in with the East Coast. We all do it. Even yeah. Chicago does sometimes when they're lazy. Yeah. Like, deal with it, Chicago. You should have moved further east if you wanted to not I be. I was like, do you have, yeah. do you get snowed in from a tundra? You're on the East Coast, bro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, police departments in major cities in the eastern seaboard in the early 1900s uh, did a bit more than just provide muscle for gangsters and crack the heads of labor organizers. Um, they also got into the business because no one else was going to do it of uh, what we'd call social welfare. Um, okay. It was kind of their job to take care of the homeless and the critically ill. Uh, and they weren't good at this. But police in Boston, New York and other cities sheltered homeless people in precincts. They emptied public toilets uh, and they kept track of the infected during epidemics. Now, since, again, these men were at the time hired gangsters uh, they were not renowned for taking to these tasks with a great deal of empathy but nobody else really gave a shit they didn't give a shit either but they were kind of the people you gave the bad jobs to again not a lot of respect for law enforcement in this period so they're like we need mm-hmm. somebody to like pull the homeless people off the streets so they don't freeze yeah. to death have the cops do it yeah so it wow. was prohibition that finally tipped law enforcement over the edge uh like over the edge of 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 creators of corruption to um so outwardly criminal that the state had to like the the federal government had to do something about them. Uh-huh. the sheer scale of corruption unleashed by uh prohibition and like the era of speakeasies and gangsters turned police departments into you know it, it, whatever they'd been before a complete mockery of law and order and yeah. federal authorities pushed reform and investigatory commissions that uh had to look into a variety of different scandals dr potter lays out just a few examples of police crime that inspired the creation of commissions quote Number one, the formation of a prostitution syndicate by Los Angeles Mayor Arthur Harper, police chief Edward Kearns, and a local organized crime figure, combined with subsequent instructions to the police to harass the syndicate's competitors in the prostitution industry. Number two, the assassination of organized crime figure Arthur Rothstein by police lieutenant Charles Becker, head of the NYPD's vice squad. And number three, a dispute between the mayor and district attorney of Philadelphia, each of whom controlled rival gambling syndicates and each of whom used loyal factions of police to harass the other. So, like... These are just a couple of examples of the sort of behavior police departments yeah. are engaging in at the time where they're uh-huh. they're they're just they're even like more criminal than a lot of the criminal syndicates. Um, yeah. Yeah. And another investigative commission that was set up during this period was the Linux Committee, which was formed to look into the charges of police extortion in New York. It found that promotion within the NYPD in the early 1900s was based entirely on direct bribes paid by officers to the department. A promotion to sergeant cost $1,600. A promotion to captain cost $15,000. All of these scandals. Wow. And many, yeah, yeah, you would just pay to get promoted in the police. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, just, it's just so crazy that, like, I mean... As much as you want to believe that, like, throughout the course of time, we have gotten somehow in some way better at being the species we are. It's just, I just, the more you know of history, the more you're like, no, we've kind of been a plateaued. We've kind of just always been like this, you know? And that's the part that just, like, no matter, (laughs) because I'm thinking about, like, 
I'm still hanging on the word on the on the phrase of like it created the corruption yeah. because I'm going well. I mean, you don't pay them a lot. You're I'm incentivized. You're like like you're just hoping these people would somehow not have the same corrupted soul as the rest of the people but they just people and they're gonna find the path of least resistance the quickest way to get a buck and the best way to like push other people down for their own success i don't know why you think putting a badge on their chest gonna make them any different so when you hear this stuff like this i'm just like god dog it was it were we ever have we we ever done good things no well Yeah, you know, there's there's a I forget who the name of the individual who it was, but there he, I believe it was a Holocaust survivor and he wrote something to the he had a, a quote that was something along the lines of in like any given period of time, like 10% of people are genuinely good, 10% of people are total monsters, and about 80% could kind of go either way depending yeah. on like where it seems how it seems the wind is blowing. Yeah. Um and like if the wind is you know, blowing in the way that it, like if if everyone in charge is literally running a criminal syndicate of like prostitution and yeah. and like uh, and probably a lot of forced prostitution and like gambling and like murder for hire and all this stuff. If that's everybody, then, yeah, that's what you get involved with. Like then like, OK, well, I'll find some way to make money within the I mean, system. It's, yeah. it's the ocean. It's the ocean. Yeah. So you just kind of like do it because that's I mean, you got to swim. Yeah, you got to yeah. swim. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the Curran Committee of 1913 uh, investigated NYPD collusion in gambling and prostitution. The Seabury Committee in 1931 also looked into the NYPD, this time into the broader system of bosses and bribery for political positions that was the core of why New York law enforcement sucked. Uh, Each Mm -hmm. of these commissions made changes, but right up until the 1950s, there were still regular inquiries into police involvement with gambling, prostitution, and organized crime. And I cannot exaggerate how many of these committees were focused on the NYPD. Like one way to look at the 20th century is the federal government fighting tooth and nail to stop New York police from being just a criminal enterprise. Like that, like that took decades of battling. Yeah. Not metaphorically, and, not as a yeah. way to understand what's happening. No, seriously, they're just no, they're just pimps criminals. with badges. Yeah. Yes. That's just what they actually and, are. And <laughs> While I was Googling around, I wanted to kind of come up with another example or two, like a direct one of the NYPD, you know, yeah. being pimps or whatnot in the, the yeah. early 1900s. And it was actually hard because there were so many cases of them in the 21st century doing the exact same thing. <laughs> For example, while I was Googling around on this, I came across a 2018 story about a retired NYPD detective who ran a $2 million brothel ring using active cops as muscle and his inside knowledge of how department undercovers did prostitution stings in order to avoid getting busted. Oh, he knew God. that like undercovers weren't allowed to show their genitals to prostitutes so he would make all of the johns strip naked and like let themselves get fondled before starting the transaction um because that helped him avoid getting busted by the nypd um yeah there were seven active duty officers who worked for his prostitution ring um Mm -hmm. one of them was actually willing to work for free in exchange for discounts with his favorite (laughs) prostitute so again 2018 is when that gets busted (laughs) (laughs) regular scumbags yeah it's awesome regular dudes just being normal scumbags yeah it's like someone decided like okay let's take 10 percent of the normal scumbag population and make them immune to being punished if they shoot someone yes (laughs) uh, wow so yeah While the federal government was fighting to make the NYPD a modestly less criminal enterprise, a major revolution had started to overtake law enforcement nationwide, and it started on the West Coast. Luminaries in, you know, that part of the country began to wonder if perhaps police officers ought not be trained professionals instead of drunken gangsters. And the (laughs) the first real apostle of this gospel was a dude named August Vollmer. Uh, He was the very first police chief of Berkeley, California, and he served from 1909 to 1931. Okay. and this this guy is about the best cop you're gonna find in U.S. history. Um, okay. From ev- yeah, from everything he did have, like his early history, he was in part of like the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. But he was like a 
like a gunboat. He worked on like a gunboat. Like I'm sure uh-huh. he like he was part of, you know, the US crimes in the Philippines, but he wasn't it's not like a case with a uh, John Burge. Like I have no yeah. evidence that he was like running secret prisons and torturing people. Like he was just a soldier who fought yeah. in a bad war. Um and then he became the police chief uh in Berkeley. And when he took the job, Berkeley police were just as corrupt as New York police. August only had a sixth grade education, but he knew enough to immediately ban the receipt of gifts and bribes for his officers. Like that was the first thing he did was like you obviously <laughs> We'd, uh, you can't take bribes anymore. This is so um, easy. Yeah. 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 Again, sixth grade education. Yeah, just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we got to stop doing this. We should, probably, we should probably not do that, huh? What if What if we weren't just gangsters? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what if um, we tried to do the job, guys? Wait, yeah. What if... What if we know. treated it like a job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he was, he's really, it's baffling the number of firsts this guy is responsible for in law enforcement. He was the first police chief to put cops on bicycles in 1910. He was the first police chief to put cops on motorcycles in 1911. Uh, his officers received the very first radios in their squad cars. Uh, Volmer's department created the first centralized police record system. And he was the first chief in the United States to push his officers to use blood, fiber, and soil analysis to solve crimes. He was one of the first chiefs to use fingerprinting. Uh, Volmer was also the first chief to require college degrees of his officers. Uh, he was one of the first uh, police chiefs to hire black cops, although not the first. Uh, but he was yeah. the very first police chief chief to hire female officers in 1919. Uh, <laughs> August was also the first police chief in the U.S. to explicitly ban the use of the third degree, uh, and he was a lifetime opponent of capital punishment. Um, he was notorious and fairly unique among lawmen in this period for believing that communists had a right to organize and state their views without being beaten into bloody pulps. Look at this guy. Yeah, he's the best cop we're going to talk about. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah, I am like... <laughs> I am impressed, bro. Like yeah. you, know, you see him riding by in his little like big, big front yeah. wheel, little silly, back wheel, silly police car, silly yeah. bike. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the old school, old timey Victorian bike. But he's a cop, and that guy you salute. Like, hey, what's mm. up, officer? You know, yeah. yeah. There's no. He pot was over trying. Here. Yeah, yeah. At he least you're trying. trying. Yeah. yeah. And now he was also one of the very first like people anywhere to teach classes in criminal justice, essentially like helping to invent that field of higher education. Like he was one of the first people to be like, we should probably have college classes that help people <laughs> do do this thing. That's a job. Yeah. Um, and one of his students was a dude named O.W. Wilson and O.W. Wilson went on to become the police chief of Fullerton. Uh, he was also the police chief of Jesus somewhere in the fucking Midwest. I forget where where else he was the police chief. And Fullerton, he was in poli- California. Yeah, Fullerton, California. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and he was also the superintendent of the Chicago PD at one point. So he was a very influential, like, running Sheesh. police departments guy. Yeah. Um, and he wrote a book called Police Administration in 1943. And this was sort of a reaction to how most cops in big cities were drunken gangsters. Um, yeah. And it basically, O.W. Wilson, you know, who is the protege of Vollmer, is like, we need to professionalize police departments nationwide. Um, and Wilson wanted Facts. police departments to be centralized uh, and formed along military style lines. This helped departments to keep a closer eye on their officers and stop them from, you know, just selling bootleg liquor or whatever. <laughs> now, so you can see the logic in what Wilson was trying to do. It, right? just like makes, it's a, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. But it didn't work um, or oh, it didn't not. work well. Yeah. <laughs> For one thing, his drive towards centralization created powerful, unaccountable authoritarian police bureaucracies that were both unaccountable to the public and to the officers that worked there. Uh, racist and sexist hiring practices were never reformed. And so these God dictatorial police bureaucrats were basically just white dudes. Um, Samuel Walker, a professor of criminal justice in Nebraska, notes that, quote, a half century of professionalization had created police departments that were vast bureaucracies, inward looking and isolated from the public and defensive in the face of any criticism, which does not sound familiar at all. No. Um, Can't win. Can't win with these guys, man. Like, Yeah. Every time you want it, like, I want to be like, oh, yeah, well, that's good. Oh, well, there it is. It never quite works out, right? No. Like they always seem to keep sucking, uh, even when you deal with what you think are the 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 problems, which maybe hints that the problem is at the root of what we have police for. Yeah. Um, as opposed to them yeah. needing bicycles. Yeah. Which when, not yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. My, yep. my 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 I remember one of my my elementary school teacher used to say, "Hey, if every place you touch on your body hurts, your finger's probably mm-hmm. broken." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Like, that's what I just think about. I'm just like, maybe your finger's broken, guys. Maybe the yeah. finger's broken. Yeah. yeah. Good good, good way to describe that. Never forgot that. Miss Durfield. So um, 
what's worse is that Wilson, like his mentor, mentor Volmer, um, both of whom I think had good intentions, had seized upon the idea that police should focus on crime prevention rather than just investigation. Now, this was not a new idea. And again, you can see the logic in trying to prevent crime. But the way that it worked out in the real world is that these new professional centralized police departments suddenly started devoting a lot more time to sending cops out on patrol to stop and search people at random. Most of these people were members of the dangerous classes, which at that point were mostly racial minorities in the United yeah. States. You know, the Irish weren't really being oppressed no more, but yeah, yeah. bring that back. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. As we've discussed, police had always worked to corral and control the movement and freedom of non-white people. Wilson's reforms helped to dress that up as crime prevention. So now the cops aren't out there to keep, you know, black people in line. They're there to patrol for criminal behavior, which Mm. in which they do the same thing. But it's harder to complain about if you're a white liberal. He's got some better codes. Yeah, exactly. Better codes. Yeah. And I don't think that was Wilson's intent, but that's what happened. Um, Now, actual police officers weren't much happier than the general public with these reforms. Their resentment at their unaccountable, distant, and all-powerful bosses helped to inspire a growing movement to unionize police departments. Now, police in many cities had long sought the benefits of unionization, but since a huge part of their literal job was busting unions and murdering (laughs) union organizers, this was a tough needle to thread. Hey, guys, I'm a little conflicted here. Yeah. (laughs) Are we aren't we killing these people for the same thing we think is a good idea for uh, oh yeah well fuck it yeah so cops in some <laughs> cities started to form fraternal associations in order to try to gain some of the same benefits of unions while also not feeling like complete they're, hypocrites for murdering being union unions people. yes yeah this did not work out well forever the, these fraternal organizations just didn't associations just didn't do what unions do. The yeah. first department to seek straight up unionization was the Cleveland police in 1897. Uh, they petitioned the American Federation of Labor, whose president Samuel Gompers turned them down, stating it is not within the province of the trade union movement to especially organize policemen, nor more than to organize militiamen, as both policemen and militiamen are often controlled by forces inimical to the labor movement. So Ooh. like, it's not our job. Like you kill us, we're not going to let you join us to it get makes more so money much to kill sense. us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, wait, yeah. you want me to help you be better at stopping us? Yeah. Nah. I, no. Yeah. No, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like buying oil from countries you're at war with. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Or like partnering with Nazis over single payer health care and ignoring the fact that they're also in favor of Nazi shit. Because like, what if we worked? No, don't work together with the no, people no, no, who no, you no, know want to kill you. Yeah. You don't want to <laughs> do that. Don't work with them ever, even if they're right about one thing. Like, cops are right. Workers should unionize. But that's, like, still. (laughs) Still, yeah. 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 There's still problems. Yes. So cops continued to seek the benefits of union membership, even whilst violently suppressing unions. In 1919, Boston's police asked the AFL for a charter, angry at, among other things, the fact that they had to pay for their own uniforms. The commissioner told them that they couldn't unionize, uh, and the AFL wasn't exactly a big fan either. Um, But when they unionized anyway, 19 union organizers were fired, and the police went on strike. This is the first police strike. With nearly 1,500 officers off the job, the people of Boston took the opportunity to loot the ever-loving shit out of their city. (laughs) And I would suggest we look at this less as a sign of human nature and more of a sign of Bostonian nature. Um, it's, yeah, that's, I was, yeah. Like, was going to say, this sounds really Boston-y. That sounds real Boston. Yeah. yeah, we'll talk about another time when this happened later and there wasn't mass looting. So I, I'm yeah. going to write this up to Boston. Yeah. Um, now, this all prompted Governor Calvin Coolidge to declare that no public safety workers could strike anywhere, anytime. And his hard stance on this is part of what helped him become president later. Wait, wait, wait. Um, He's saying, nope. What was he? What was his position then when he said that? Public safety workers should never be able to strike. No, was he? A, no, I'm saying what was the office he held? Oh, he was the governor. He, he was, was the, the governor, governor at that point. So yeah. wait, so he was saying y'all not allowed to strike, and I'm like, well, yeah, okay, that's stupid because that's the definition of striking yeah. is like. So even the procl that's like the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm like, oh, you finna set free the slaves in the states that are rebelling? Like you, what? Huh? So I'm just sorry, just him making the proclamation just like sounded so stupid. I'm like, that's striking means we not listening to you anyway. Yeah, yeah. But there's also the question of whether or not the government can stop a strike. Like if a bunch of J.C. Penney's workers or whatever are unionized and they go on strike, there's the, the federal government can't do anything about that. But it's why yeah. like when um 
when the fucking uh, uh, air traffic controllers would yeah. not strike. Like they're oh. like, no, we we will criminally punish these people because their jobs are like we can't have a society without their jobs, so we can't Touché. let them strike. That's okay, the idea. I'm not I defending that, but that's the justification. Now I get it. Okay, like, so it's not as it's not as preposterous as I first thought. Okay, it it, yeah. it is not. Like there's an okay. I don't necessarily agree with it, but there's an argument to be made that like okay, well, but if all of the EMTs go on strike. Um, people will die. But also yeah. like, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not saying that I don't think EMT should be able to yeah, strike. Yeah, I'm totally. saying it's different than just like minors going on strike or whatever. It totally, Although, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. like, I, I, yeah. I, at least, I don't necessarily condone it, but at least but, it's not, it's not a ridiculous statement. It yeah. is a, it is a thing that we should have debated as a nation. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Cause it is different. So yeah. yeah, the Coolidge's stance was more or less the last word on police unions and police striking in particular until the 1950s and the professionalization of police departments. Okay. These years were the heyday for unions elsewhere in the country and cops watched jealously as the now aging workers they'd spent years tear gassing reaped the benefits of collective <laughs> bargaining. Fraternal orders proved incapable of gaining officers the wages and benefits that they thought they deserved. So in the early 1960s, police started engaging in slowdowns starting in New York by 19. And this is where they they wouldn't strike, but they wouldn't do most of the things cops are supposed to do. So they would you know, they were saying, like, if the people are getting murdered, we'll step in there. But like, we're not going to stop petty crime. So they're uh, still okay. on and strike see- now. <laughs> ah, yeah, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, Sophie, because this happens real recently. Um, by 1964, they had, you know, pissed off the people in charge, the people with money, um, by not enforcing like minor bullshit enough that the mayor and the police commissioner were willing to go to the table. In exchange for giving up any right to strike, the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association was made a union. It was given the ability to act as a collective bargaining agent for the city police. Upon becoming a full union, the PBA moved immediately to what would become its true purpose, protecting cops from any kind of accountability for their own actions. In 1966, the new mayor of New York sat down with the Congress for Racial Equality, who had some serious complaints about police misconduct towards black New Yorkers. The mayor agreed to add four civilian members to the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which had previously consisted of three cops. The PBA fought this viciously, holding a 5,000-member picket line in opposition to the idea of giving civilians any say and how their police functioned. I'm going to quote next from an article in The New Yorker. The PBA then organized a public referendum aimed at eliminating the board. It put up posters showing a young white woman exiting a subway and heading onto a dark, deserted street. The civilian review board must be stopped, the poster read. Her life, your life, may depend on it. Here we go. A police officer must not hesitate. If he does, the security and safety of your family may be jeopardized. You see what they're arguing there. This is I again, see exactly yeah, what they're arguing. Yeah. 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 If if you let civilians watch what we do, we might not kill the dangerous non white people threatening white women yeah, fast yeah. enough. Yeah. Like there that's what they're like, that's what they're saying. Yeah. There's the weapon. There's the weapon. Yeah. There's there's the goat. There's the toolkit. Yeah. But our but we have to protect our women. Yeah. Yeah. Nineteen sixty six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you like that? I was like, we you have know, to I, pre- I, I, I enjoyed yeah. that. You know what else I enjoy, Robert? You know what? Won't protect white. No, no. Okay. Um, shit. That was a bad way to lead him. That into was this. horrible. Um, you know what supports police accountability um, and thinks that we can have safe subways without unaccountable, heavily armed maniacs? Man. The product. I sure do hope so. Yeah, they all, all of, ads. we're back. It's oh. good to know, as a side note, it's good to know that these like abysmal transitions are actually natural. Like it's not, yeah. it's not a no. stick. You're not like no. trying to be, you know, aloof. Yeah. I, re- you're really, you're really doing this. Yeah, I I decided long ago never to learn how to do fully half of my job. Um, it's to it's to maintain authenticity, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. It's to I maintain it. authenticity. That's wh- how brand. I justify not learning how to do large portions of my job. Yeah, it's called it's called brand. It's brand protection. I get it. it exactly. exactly. It's just like if you find like E. coli in your meat, it's like listen, it's organic. Okay, mm-hmm. we don't use pesticides. Yeah. You might you might get botulism, but you organic know organic botulism. It's organic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
so yeah, when we last left off, the the New York City police in 1966 had put up some real racy posters um, arguing about why they shouldn't let civilians tell them not to murder people. And as the vote on whether or not to establish this review board approached, uh, the PBA's president, John Cassis, um, Mm -hmm. declared, I'm sick and tired of giving in to minority groups with their whims and gripes and shouting. Oh, man. Yeah, real cool what's happening Yeah, I physically responded to that. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all always complaining. Yeah, they, you don't like us shooting you. <laughs> yeah, you want some say oh. in whether or not we shoot you with the bullets you help buy. <laughs> yes. Can <sighs> I just do my job? That's literally all we're asking. Is just that you do your job. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Please. Um. Ugh. So uh, around the country, cops elsewhere saw how good a job the NYPD had done at winning better pay for themselves and sticking a thumb in the eye of those pesky minorities who felt like someone should stop them from. Yeah. Uh, police unionizations spread throughout the continent, and over the years, police unions bargained for a hell of a lot more than just increased wages. Starting in New York, but spreading quickly over the nation, many police union contracts began requiring departments to erase officer disciplinary records after a set period of time. And this kind of gets to the chief problem of police unions. They act in the interest of officers, and obviously unions are supposed to act in the interest of workers. But a lot of times, because of the kind of people who become police officers, uh, the interest of the officers means acting against the interests of general society. So if, for example, a minor or a, a grocery store employee, or uh, uh, oh, any other kind of worker, really, gets more money, that might be against the interests of the people who own stock in the company, you know, of the capital holding yeah. class, of, like like of, of, of the people who, you know, the, the executives at the top who have to take pay cuts. You could argue that's against their interest. Um, yeah. But they don't, if a if somebody who works like they, they're not able to like the fucking a, a, a union representing grocery store employees doesn't make it impossible for you to tell which grocery store employees are stabbing people because grocery yes. store employees don't do that. And when they do, they tend to go to prison and stop yes. working at the nobody. Nobody. The, the unions don't rush in to be like, no, no, no. You have to keep employing this man. All he did was stab three people. Like, yeah, I'm like that. Yeah, the, the union yeah. doesn't protect you from being from sucking at your job right i mean it does a little bit like that's a that's a fair argument that like unions keep people sometimes like teachers who are bad at teaching stay on okay yeah 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 yeah. yeah, fair fair enough but but like the point going back to your analogy i'm like yeah you can't just lick the apples yeah and then be like yo my union protects me because i got a right to lick the apples and i'm like yeah no you I don't no. know why is, that's not your function. Like, you know, I think, and just going back to the police, I'm like, you know what, dude, you have a hard job. You should be paid well. You're right. Mm-hmm. You should be paid well. You have a hard job. But what is not your job is being another gang in our neighborhoods and terrorizing people of color. That's not your job. Yeah, you should and- not be protected for doing that. That's what unions protect them for. Instead of just being like, oh, well, we're workers too and we should be able to advocate for higher pay. They're like, and also if we beat someone, we should be able to hide that from the public. Um, That's what happens almost immediately with you. You don't get to, you don't, that's not one of your perks, okay? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest perk. So, yeah. Yeah. A 2017 Reuters special report on police union contracts in 82 U.S. cities found that most departments are now required to erase officer disciplinary records after a set period of time. Sometimes officers' records are purged every six months. 18 cities expunged suspensions in three years or less. Reuters found that nearly half of police union contracts guaranteed officers accused of bad behavior the right to see their entire investigative file, including witness statements made against them. What is their what I wonder what their defense for that is, because we know exactly what you're doing. But what what's yeah. their argument for that? Do you know, oh, you know, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't No, It's not fair for anyone to be charged with a, a, a crime without, you know, getting to see the ch- claims made by their accusers, unless those people are charging the police uh, are being charged by the police of a crime. And then there's actually all sorts of ways we have to hide that. Yeah. Sort of thing, say, like, yeah. 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 It's the cool. Dissonance is cognitive. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. 
few developments in U.S. policing have had quite the impact that unionization has had. Dr. Rob Gilzo, uh, an assistant professor of economics at the University of Victoria, took to Twitter at the end of this May when the uprising started to give a summary of some of his still unpublished research on the impact of police bargaining rights on the killing of civilians. And he noted, quote, What are we finding so far? The introduction of access to collective bargaining drives a modest decline in policy employment and increase in compensation with no meaningful impacts on total crime, violent crime, property crime, or officers killed in the line of duty. What does change? We find a substantial increase in police killings of civilians over the medium to long run. So there yes, is, uh, we will continue. There's a lot more evidence than just that, 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 that yeah. unionization specifically leads to more police killings of civilians. Now, Gilzo goes yeah. on to note that the overwhelming majority of these added deaths are non-white people. Okay. Yep. I, know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, quote, if access to a union simply shifted the marginal decision for officers to shoot in risky situations, you would expect to see increases in killings of both whites and non-whites. But that is not what we're finding at all. Rather, and with the caveat that this is still very early work, it looks like collective yeah. bargaining rights are being used to protect the ability of officers to discriminate and the disproportionate use of force against the non-white population. Again, yeah. A big part of this issue is that white supremacy is baked into the very soul of U.S. policing. So even though police unions didn't come into the picture until 100 years after slavery ended, a lot of the cops, most of the cops working in the police at that time, were racist as hell. And so police yeah. unions immediately turned to the task of enshrining and protecting racial violence from law enforcement. And that has remained a part of them ever since. Other research That's has so consistently crazy. borne out similar conclusions. A 2018 University of Oxford study of the 100 largest American cities found that protections in police contracts were directly and positively correlated with police violence against citizens. A 2019 University of Chicago study found that when collective bargaining rights were given to Florida sheriff's deputies, it led to a 40 percent statewide increase in violent misconduct by deputies. God, dog. 40 40 percent. <laughs> God. Dog. Yeah. When you yeah. okay, it's the stuff that you in, that you can intuit intuit yeah. and know, and then when you see the actual numbers, yeah, it's still like you still throw up in your mouth a little, you know? Cause yeah, it's like I you're like I, I that's why I keep trying to say it's like yeah, I mean I know that, <sighs> but now that I'm looking at it on paper or listening to someone go no here here it is no you're right. God, dog, it's still just so infuriating and exhausting that despite all these receipts that you're, you're showing, we still have to explain to people that there's a problem. Yeah. If, if yeah. a new type of if a new type of hybrid engine came out and we found out a year in that it led to a 40 percent increase in vehicle explosions during like fender benders. Yeah. Not only would that product be pulled from the market, yeah. people would probably go to jail. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they would get prosecuted. Whoever there, made it, that, the, yeah, it would be a me, problem. <laughs> four out of ten people going to die. Yeah. Would we drive this thing? Yeah, nah. Yeah. Yeah. We would at least try. Yeah, At least try. Yeah. Yeah. So... Much of the violence caused by police unions can be blamed on the fact that they make it as hard as possible to fire dangerously unhinged and violent officers. And I'm going to quote yeah. again from The New Yorker here. Other studies revealed that many existing mechanisms for disciplining police are toothless. WBEZ, a Chicago radio station, found that between 2007 and 2015, Chicago's Independent Police Review Authority investigated 400 shootings by police and deemed the officers justified in all but two incidents. Since 2012, when Minneapolis replaced its Civilian Review Board with an Office of the Police Misconduct Review, the public has filed more than 2,600 misconduct complaints, yet only 12 resulted in a police officer being punished. The most severe penalty? A 40-hour suspension. When the St. Paul Pioneer Press reviewed appeals involving termination I'm sorry, from 2014 wait, wait, wait. to 2000. 40-hour suspension? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. 2,600 oh, misunder... Yeah. When the St. Paul Pioneer Press reviewed appeals involving <laughs> terminations from 2014 to 2019, it discovered that arbitrators ruled in favor of the discharged police and correction officers and ordered them reinstated 46% of the time. Non-law enforcement workers were reinstated at a similar rate. And again, that's the point that like normal unions do work this way as well, but they're not representing people who have the right to shoot people yes for those demanding more accountability a large obstacle is that disciplinary actions are often overturned if an arbitrator finds that the penalty in the department meted out is tougher than it was in a similar previous case no matter if the penalty in the previous case was far too lenient 
dude. Yeah. So where's the like the trope like? Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking the movie trope of like Pulaski, badge and gun. Like the chief is like, give me your badge and gun. You're well, on leave, right? And then, but the guy's such one tough cop, but he still investigates the crime. I'm like, I it don't sound like I don't know where y'all got that from because it sounded to me like you know what I'm saying. Cop, I, I, I'm, I'm rambling, but. I'm trying to just like, where did, so where did that come from? Then where's the like, yeah, when, yeah. You know what this I mean? This is actually what we're getting into because it turns out that it, it is accurate that a lot of the times uh, police chiefs hate and try to fire their worst and most dangerous officers and police oh, unions make that impossible. That's actually what we're getting uh, into right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I'm, the, already, I'm already, I'm already, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning into it. Okay. Yeah, and again, this is like, like I'm sure that there are fucking people in unions who work at tire factories or whatever who are bad yeah. at their jobs, get fired, and the union gives them their job back, and yeah. like that probably is a pain in the ass for some of the people they work around. But again, they don't I'm get to carry die. a gun. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The yeah. tire guy ain't gonna shoot me. Ain't gonna put his knee on my my neck. Yeah, which isn't to say that like there aren't some problems with other unions, but like it's totally. a, really a problem with the police. Yes. Um, yeah. So the Washington Post put together a great article about this in 2017, noting that in the last 11 years, uh, 1,881 officers had been fired from the nation's largest police departments, and 451 of those officers had successfully appealed and gotten their jobs back. Those 451 included an officer who raped a 19-year-old in his patrol car, an officer oh who challenged a handcuffed man to a fist fight for his freedom, and of what? course, a cop who shot an unarmed man to death. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> we gotta we gotta get this guy back on the street yeah <laughs> gotta give him another chance to win that fist fight <laughs> yeah i'm like there's the like tragically disgusting and then there's the preposterous like you just yeah. you challenge the guy like he got on handcuffs a handcuffed wanna, man to a fight you for wanna, his freedom you want to box him like <laughs> yeah you nerd like yeah <laughs> if you weren't so deadly yeah. You know what I'm saying? I wish I could just be like, you're a nerd, man. Yeah, and yeah. like part of me is like, I would kind of like to get into a fist fight with a cop in that situation, but I know that if you start losing, you're going to shoot me. <laughs> that's, that's You can't yeah, win. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's no win. winning that fight. Yes. Um, one of my favorite stories uh, in this, this really, really wonderful Washington Post article is the 2012 tale of Boston police officer Baltazar Tate de Rosa. In 2003, DeRosa's cousin was ambushed by a masked gunman and murdered in what was probably a gang-related crime. In 2005, okay. DeRosa called in sick for his overnight shift. He went out to a nightclub, the Copa Grande Oasis, instead with a dude named Carlos de Pina, who was the, his cousin and the brother of his cousin who got murdered. Okay. While at the club, both men encountered Jose Lopez, a gang member who was a suspect in the murder of DeRosa's cousin. Carlos wound up murdering Jose Lopez, using his off-duty cop cousin as a getaway driver. So DeRosa, who took the night off claiming to be sick and went and got wasted at a nightclub with his cousin when his cousin murders a guy acts as the getaway driver and obviously when this is found out he gets placed on administrative leave and he's charged with being an accessory to murder um yeah he he was acquitted of that crime but he was fired from the department when the investigation revealed that he'd actually been arrested with his cousin at that club before due to a drunken disorderly conduct um so again they find out like okay maybe this guy didn't know he was being the getaway driver in a murder that his cousin committed but he knew that he was repeatedly getting drunk at the club while he should have been working and like we should fire him for that he lied about it to us um so DeRosa appealed the firing. In 2012, he was reinstated with $50,000 in lost pay and overtime. He is currently a Boston Bike Patrol officer. Wait, that boy <laughs> got the money back? Yeah, of course. They always get the money back. Oh, my. That, oh, dog. He got and at the least, money back. That one's a fun one because at least like yeah. the guy that they murdered sounded like a piece of shit, too. Whatever. Because yeah. um, it's yeah. just like, look, man. This again, y'all. Just, they you just gang banging, and like, yeah. that is the most that it, that story. That's funny because it's the most like spot on any inner city USA anywhere story, right? That's like that's me. Like, if let's just um say I'm working stiff, you know, I still taught high school. I'm just gonna go chill with one of my cousins because yeah. that's my cousin. We're all from South Central LA, right? My cousin gets in a static with somebody else. What am I gonna not help him? That's my cousin. You know what I'm saying? So like, okay, yeah, maybe I lose my job, you know, 
but like, I just like, I, you know, I mean, well, that's my cousin, man. Like, I'm going to, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to help, I'm going to help scrap with my cousin, you know? Um, and then I'm supposed to think of you any different because you got a badge, right? No, you just like the rest of us. You're going to do ratchet shit because you ratchet like all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the point exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. In 2007, Fort Worth police officer Jesus Jesse Banda Jr. stalked his ex-girlfriend to a party, saw her with another man, and used a poli- like called into police dispatch to check on the plates of the man she was with fraudulently, claiming that he had like stopped the guy or whatever. So he found the address of the dude that his ex-girlfriend was going out with, and several days later, he showed up at the man's house at night and shot the car up with his 12-gauge. The department couldn't prove he'd committed the crime, but they were able to show that he'd lied about why he had called in the man's license plate, like a night or two before his car got shot up yeah so the police chief did the give me your badge and gun thing and he put banda on unpaid suspension um and while he was suspended and under investigation he was ordered not to represent himself as a police officer so like you're handing in your badge and gun we're going to investigate you you are not getting paid and if you tell anyone you're a police officer to try to get you know the benefits police officers get like you're breaking the fucking law right now yeah so Banda went out and represented himself as a police officer almost of course immediately. He, did. Yeah. he and some friends were pulled over by another Fort Worth cop while they were drunk in a limousine. Said cop had watched the people in the back of the limo, including Banda, pass beer up to the driver. So again, real hard to get in trouble for drinking in a limousine. This fucking dude finds a way. How you um, wait, <laughs> passed it to the driver? Here, drink this, yeah, bro. Like, yeah. word, what that's the fuck why is you, wrong you, with you? Yeah. What are you doing, man? Yeah. 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 So when he asked Banda to step out of the car, Banda handed over his police credentials and pretended to be an officer in good standing. Despite all this, the union had Banda's back and they fought for him. He was reinstated and awarded a year of back pay. So again, the police chief is like, I don't want this fucking guy in my department. And the union's like, you are going to take him back and you're going to pay him for the time when he was getting drunk in limousines. (laughs) (laughs) officer banda had been back on the force for one month before he was fired again for again misrepresenting himself during a traffic stop he is currently he was reinstated by the union he is currently a detective and thanks to his union the people of fort worth have to brave the streets of their town knowing a guy who uses department resources to hunt down the boyfriends of his ex-partners is out there with the power to arrest whoever and apparent immunity to the consequences of any illegal actions he takes so that's good congrats fort worth wow fort worth this is Great. Yeah. Good job, Fort Worth. In 2014, uh, 17 Robert, year old before you Laquan, get into that. Yeah. Should, yeah. That thing. Oh, that product. thing. Thing. Yeah. Dang. That is not the note. That's embarrassing. That thing. That thing. That thing. That thing. That thing. That thing. Robert doesn't yeah. get it. But there okay. we go. I don't, but we're going to go to products now. We're back, and we started talking about carne asada fries, which I am normally very happy with my decision to live in the Pacific Northwest, but yeah. whenever somebody says carne asada, I long yeah. for Southern California. Ah, oh, it's nothing oh. like it. Yeah. Right. So, oh, I could go for some carne asada fries, but we're gonna, <laughs> we have to talk about police unions instead. Yes. So, um, yeah, so uh, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, Juan McDonald. Um, so, oh. yeah, in 2014, 17 year old Laquan McDonald was murdered by Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke. The media mm. furor around this launched an investigation, which revealed that Officer Van Dyke had previously been the subject of repeated complaints. Mm. The report noted that a code of silence about misconduct was baked into labor agreements between police unions and the city, and that this ensured that nothing had been done about Officer Van Dyke before he killed a child. Van Dyke was eventually convicted of second-degree murder and 16 accounts of aggravated battery with a firearm. 16 is the number of times he shot him. Yeah. Um, uh, Van Dyke was found not guilty of any official misconduct, though. So he was guilty of murder, but not guilty of improperly behaving as a police officer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Square you that did circle. murder somebody, and you're going to go to prison for it, but you also didn't break the rules of your job. <laughs> but you, but, yeah, but your job's fine. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what do we do with that one? Yeah. Ironically, given their role in murdering the shit out of unions for close to 100 years, police might be the most successful example of unionization in his U.S. history. Not in terms of, like, benefit to society or no. even benefit to the profession of policing, but at least in terms of the sheer amount of power that they wield. They protect their officers, boy. They, like, you know what I'm Jesus. Saying? Yeah. Yes. 
Labor historian Joseph McCartan notes, they have more clout than other public sector unions, like the teachers and sanitation workers, because they have often been able to command the political support of Republicans. That's given them a huge advantage. Police unions are one fortunate area where we have a single human being who embodies all of the evil that these institutions represent and do. And when I talk about a single human being who embodies the evil of police unions, there's no one else I could be talking about but Lieutenant Bob Kroll, head of the Let's Minneapolis go. Police Union. Yeah, president of the Minneapolis Police Union. Bob has, of course, appealed the firing of Derek Chauvin and the other three cops who murdered George Floyd, saying that they were is. fired without due process. Um and this is something of a pattern for him. In 2015, when two white MPD officers shot 24-year-old Jamar Clark in the head while he was handcuffed on the ground, Kroll went on TV to talk about Clark's violent criminal past and declare yeah. BLM a terrorist organization. Yeah, Kroll has a real thing for declaring people he disagrees with of being terrorists. He did the same thing to U.S. Representative Keith Ellison, a black Muslim congressman who pushed for criminal justice reform. That fun detail came out in a lawsuit filed by the current MPD police chief. According to Mother Jeff, Jones, the lawsuit accused Kroll of wearing a motorcycle jacket with a white power patch sewed into the fabric and said he had a history of discriminatory attitudes and conduct. He has told reporters he was part of the City Heat Motorcycle Club, some of whose members have been described by the Anti-Defamation League as displaying white supremacist symbols. Bob Kroll joined the MPD back in 1989, and in his years on the force, there were 20 or more internal affairs complaints made against him. We don't know 20. how many. Compl- yeah, minimum. We yeah. actually don't know how many it was because of all the shit I've been explaining. They purge records, but at least yeah. 20. What we job? Do know. Yeah, it's what crazy. What job can you have 20 on record? Yeah, imagine, uh, I'm going to, like, imagine, I, I, I'm reading you what I'm going to tell you next, and uh, yeah. imagine that, like, he worked as a baker, or, like, yeah, yeah. like, like as a yeah. computer Repla- programmer. Yeah, yeah, everybody, replace cop with, with the- donut maker. Yeah, sanitation yes. worker. Sanitation worker, yes. In 1994, he was suspended for using excessive force, and in 1995, he was accused of beating, choking, and kicking a biracial 15-year-old while shouting racial slurs. What the f- <laughs> Yeah. Bob Kroll. In 2004, when Kroll was off duty, someone leaving a bar bumped his backpack against Kroll's car. Bob and another off duty officer got out and beat the piss out of this guy. When his friends came to help, they beat the shit out of his friends too. Bob was suspended for 20 days for this. It's it's cartoonish. Like, yeah. we're like this is cartoon level. Yes. Mm-hmm. The Minneapolis. <clears throat> The Minneapolis police knew all of this when they elected Bob Kroll to be their union president by a two to one margin. Bob won because the citizens of Minneapolis had just elected a reform minded police chief. She told The New York Times, I believe Bob Kroll was elected out of fear. We are the only ones that support Mm. you. Your community doesn't support you. Your police chief is trying to get you fired. Mm. You see what I'm building to here. Police unions allow the cops to deliberately short circuit the democratic process. This is part of why bringing in better police chiefs and voting in reform minded mayors almost never actually does a damn thing when it comes to reforming the police. Yeah. Because the unions are still there, and they stonewall anything from happening. When Kim Garner was elected DA of St. Louis in 2016, she promised to fight police violence on behalf of her citizens. One of the ways she proposed to do this was by establishing an independent oversight board to investigate abuses by police. Like the PBA in New York more than a half century earlier, the police union in St. Louis set right to work killing this oversight board. They went to lawmakers one by one, and whatever they said stopped the matter from even coming to a vote. According to the New York Times, quote, around the same time, a lawyer for the union waged a legal fight to limit the ability of the prosecutor's office to investigate police misconduct. The following year, a leader of the union said Miss Gardner should be removed by force or by choice. Wow. 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 That's cool. Can you chat? Can you just. Wow. It's like. I just it's it's comic book level power. Like and I just imagine like you know in in every comic book when the uh, when the bad guy goes like I feel the power like I feel like that's just that must be what it's like to where you're like after a while just you just know you can get away with it and anybody that comes in to try to stop you you got the power to remove like it just God dog like. It must be intoxicating. It must. It's got to be a drug. Like, it's got to be a drug. 
It it's is a be drug. drug. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. They're high on fucking power. And if you've yes. ever, I mean, I don't know. Have you? Have you never? Have you never pistol whipped a guy? Never. It in my is life. great. Oh my god. Oh my god. Pistol whipping a dude. It's like, it's like a, it's like that first slice of cherry pie on a birthday. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's how it's now, like. Yeah. Yeah. No wonder they want to protect it. I get it. I get yeah. it. You're like, this is super fun. Now, mm-hmm. I've, yeah, it's, it's terrible. I've been in enough like fist fights to know I don't like them. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I've been in enough to be like, I don't like them because of the pain, but I also don't like them because you just walk away. Like, even if it's just like, that dude's a freaking scumbag and he deserved it, you're still like, I don't, you know... I don't, I don't feel good have to about do this. this. I don't feel good yeah. about it. Yeah, you yeah. still walk away like, man, I don't feel good about it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and I was uh, I was joking about pistol. Of weapons, course, but I I do wonder. I do wonder if we could yeah. succeed in police abolition. What if we just made it legal for everyone to own grenade launchers and tear gas grenades and rubber bullets, and then Yo. the crowd of protesters could confront the police on an even yeah. like? Would they enjoy being riot cops? Yeah, less? <laughs> like, yeah. If they you were having getting flash banged back. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can tell you. I've seen some protesters throw like mortars, like fireworks, back at police who are shooting grenades at them, and they don't seem to yeah. like it. <laughs> no, no, yeah, it's crazy, huh? You yeah. one would think, mm-hmm. right? That'll teach yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, if if the way that police unions respond when elected officials try to restrict the powers and rights of the police sounds kind of like how the mob works, you're not the only person to think that way. <laughs> Back in Minneapolis, city councilman Steve Fletcher noted that once he started pushing to freeze the MPD from hiring new officers, the police mm-hmm. stopped responding as quickly to 911 calls made by his constituents. Ooh, he called it a little bit like a protection racket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, Steve. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Public Enemy used to have a song called 911 is a joke. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And, it's, and, 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 and like people think they were just like, what, is, what are they talking about? No, you don't understand that they don't have to come when we call. Yeah. You could decide like this, eh, I'm just not going to go over there. Yeah. And it's it's funny because uh, of the protests in Portland and stuff. And like, I know yeah. a lot of people who have been the victims of, of crimes in Portland. I've been the victims of crimes, thankfully yeah. not here, but in other cities. And like, it always takes a hell of a long time for the police to respond. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when the protests here wound up in the neighborhood where the mayor's mansion is, and so they're like they were surrounded by mansions and people started shining lasers in windows and like setting yeah. off smoke bombs, the police were fucking right there. Really like, quick. They, like, they got yeah. there so fucking quick. <laughs> That's crazy, man. You guys' response time is so oh, wow. better today. That's... Wow, you guys are you guys are really on the ball when this really neighborhood, today, this specific neighborhood gets this, fucked with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about police unions later. For now, there's another major subject we've got to pivot to. Uh, okay. Broken windows policing. Yeah, and buddy. And this is, you've heard of broken windows, right? Bro, this is the one that like when, this is the stuff you're getting into that like, our like dads and big brothers and cousins would sit us down and say, Hey, this is how it works. You need to protect yourself. They was explaining this stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, In 2012, a teenager named Alvin Cruz was stopped by police and searched. This was not unusual for Cruz. It had happened to him numerous times before. And the officers searching him, this was in New York, by the way, and the officers searching him never explained why they were doing it. But this time, because he was just fucking tired of being hassled so many times by the police, Alvin secretly recorded the encounter. And he caught on tape the officer's response when he asked him why he was being stopped. The cop told him, for being a fucking mutt, you know that. Another officer twisted his arm behind his back after this and shouted, dude, I'm going to break your fucking arm and then I'm going to punch you in the fucking face. Oh, gosh. This tape went real viral and it was cited in the ruling of a federal judge later that year um, when the judge ruled that the NYPD's stop and frisk policy was unconstitutional and racially discriminatory. Yeah. Stop and frisk is not a policy unique to New York. But as we've learned, the NYPD tend to be trailblazers. This tactic involves basically stopping random people, virtually all of whom are black or Hispanic, and searching them for contraband with little to no cause. Stop and frisk was justified by the best minds available to 1980s law enforcement. James Q. Wilson and George L. Kelling. Do you know anything about yeah. either of these guys? 
Uh, not personally, except for they're the reason why I can't walk home with a friend. Yeah, <laughs> a kid, yeah. you're gonna learn some not surprising stuff about them. But yeah, yeah. yeah, in 1982, Wilson and Kelling published an article in the Atlantic that became the foundation of what we now know as broken windows policing. Probably the most single most influential article in the history of yeah. law enforcement. Their chief argument bo- was boiled down in this sentence: If a window in a building is broken and left unrepaired, all the rest of the windows will soon be broken. Yeah. So in order to keep crime down and keep neighborhoods nice, they argued, all violations of public order have to be sternly punished and prosecuted. Searching random black and Latino kids and occasionally beating the shit out of them is just the price we pay for making sure those kids don't have spray paint on them or whatever, yeah. you know, or aren't going to sell a little bit of weed or something like, because any small criminal violation will inevitably lead to the total destruction of the neighborhood. So we have to yeah. police this little shit as harshly as possible. Yeah. Now, Wilson and Kelling's new theory of policing was presented as scientific, backed up by the latest data, but that was a complete sham. There was only a single piece of hard evidence behind their theory, and they didn't interpret it the way the, the actual researchers who did the study um con- interpreted it. And okay. that single piece of evidence was a 1969 study by every psych student's favorite problematic researcher, Philip Zimbardo. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, fucking love me some Zimbardo. <laughs> Come on, you know let's what go. It, he was like there's a lot of real good criticisms of Philip Zimbardo, but it, yeah. his work is never boring. Like it's always no. like I want to fucking do some weird I'm going to make a prison and staff it with teenagers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This guy, there's a few people that make it into your history books that you're just like, how, why are we studying him? I would love to drink with Philip you know? Zimbardo. Like as someone who is yeah. critical of virtually all of his research, he sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he still sounds like he'd be a fun head. Yeah. <laughs> So this particular 1969 study by Zimbardo had been inspired by the 1968 riots and uprisings. Obviously, like Zimbardo had just like watched the entire country convulsed by something that was in a lot of ways even more like even more serious than what we're we're seeing right now. Yeah. Um, And he was like, I should probably do some science about that shit. Yeah. Um, So he was frustrated, uh, particularly that conservatives blamed vandalism on individual criminality. So conservatives were blaming like vandalism during protest on the criminal nature of individual protesters. And he thought this was wrong. He thought that Uh vandalism had more to do with crowd mentality than individual characteristics. So Uh in order to test his hypothesis, he and his team parked, got two Oldsmobiles and they parked one in the South Bronx and the other in Palo Alto, California. California. Oh, they surveilled gosh. both cars and they watched what happened to them. Now, Zimbardo, because yeah. he was a little bit racist, expected the Oldsmobile in the Bronx would be swiftly vandalized and torn apart. And he was yeah. right, but he was surprised that the first vandals were a white, well-dressed family and not black teenagers. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Still, which is not. Th- yeah. Go ahead. No, no. Yeah. I was going to say because like, and I, I'm saying this completely anecdotally, it's because when you black and brown, you already know they gonna blame me anyway. So I can't. Now nah, I'm not gonna touch that. You know what's gonna happen? Like mm-hmm. they come over here kill us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he was surprised by this, but he felt that his central yeah. hypothesis was supported. Um, the lack yeah. of community cohesion, this is his conclusion, the lack of community cohesion in the Bronx produced a sense of anonymity, which gave people permission to commit acts of vandalism. He okay. wrote, conditions that create social inequality and put some people outside of the conventional reward structure of the society make them indifferent to its sanctions, laws, and implicit norms. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That's yeah. quite a sentence. That is quite a sentence. So, like, yeah, that happens to the Oldsmobile in Harlem, um, or not Harlem, in the Bronx. Um, and the Oldsmobile he parked in Palo Alto suffered a, a somewhat different fate. According to the Washington Post, quote, after a week-long unremarkable stakeout, Zimbardo drove the car to the Stanford campus, where his research team aimed to prime vandalism by taking a sledgehammer to its windows. Upon discovering that this was stimulating and pleasurable, Zimbardo and his <laughs> graduate students got carried away. <laughs> As Zimbardo described it, one student jumped on the roof and began stomping it in. Two were pulling out the door from its hinges. Another hammered away at the hood and motor, while the last one broke all the glass he could find. The passers. 
<laughs> the passers-by the study had intended to observe had turned into spectators and only joined in after the car was already wrecked. Zimbardo's conclusions were the stuff of liberal criminology. Anyone, even Stanford researchers, could be lured into vandalism. And yes. this was particularly true in places like the Bronx with heightened social inequalities. For yes. Zimbardo, what happened in the Bronx and at Stanford suggested that crowd mentality, social inequalities, and community anonymity could prompt good citizens to act destructively. This was no radical critique. It was an indictment of law and order politics that viewed vandalism as a senseless, unpardonable act. In a line that could have been lifted directly out of the countless riot reports published in the late 1960s, Zimbardo asserted, vandalism is rebellion with a cause. Hmm. Which, so, I can get yeah. behind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't. I can't speak to the accuracy of Zimbardo's conclusions about the Bronx, particularly yeah. like his, his attitudes about community there. Um, yeah. Also, it was not a place he understood very well. Yeah. Um, and he was clearly a man with some biases. Mm. Uh, but I I can't argue with his conclusions about Palo Alto because in part of yeah. what I saw in Riot Night in Portland, which was the night after the third precinct in Minneapolis burned, uh-huh. um, I know that like, you know, people rioted in fucking Portland. They, they fucked up the Justice Center and like lit yeah. it on fire and they 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 destroyed like a they damaged a lot of the luxury shopping district and looted it. And it yeah. was blamed on like Antifa white anarchist kids. But like I was there. It yeah. was a pretty fucking broad cross section of the yeah. Portland population who was you can tell. I've seen enough people break windows. You can tell when someone knows how to break a window and when uh-huh. someone is breaking a window for the first time. A lot of first yeah. time window, a lot, lot of experienced window breakers in that crowd. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. A lot of yeah. first time window breakers. who just got taken timers. in by the moment. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think that that's probably accurate that like yeah. most vandalism that happens in times like these is not the result of people who are as a lot of folks like to portray them inherently criminal. Um, yeah. Not that I, I even feel comfortable like judging people on that basis. But I think most of that kind of vandalism is just like, oh, fuck it. I can get away with this now. Yeah, I want to yeah, break yeah, something. Yeah. Like, it's fuck it. Yeah, let's, yeah. yeah, I'm angry and like I feel like this uh-huh. is an option now. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, so yeah, th- the Oldsmobile study was actually not very influential initially, and it sort of languished in the annals of academic history for a decade and a half until Wilson and Kelling, uh, the guys who ri- wrote that Atlantic article on the broken windows theory, uh-huh. until they came across it. So they didn't listen to anything Zimbardo had actually said about crowd mentality and community am- anonymity. They kind of ignored all of the actual conclusions in the study um, mm-hmm. and took from it only the fact that, quote, one unrepaired broken window is a signal that no one cares. And so breaking more windows costs nothing. Yeah. So. Both of these guys cite the Zimbardo theory as the entire academic basis of their theory on crime, or the Zimbardo study, but they actually interpreted it in a way that ran completely at odds to the person conducting the study's own conclusions. And I'm going to quote from the Washington Post again. Okay. Their misleading recap of Zimbardo's study not only conflated the Stanford and Palo Alto experiments, but so distorted the order of events that it routed readers away from Zimbardo's conclusions. In their version, the car in Palo Alto sat untouched for more than a week. Z- then Zimbardo smashed part of it with a sledgehammer. Soon, passersby were joining in. What they conveniently neglected to mention was that the researchers themselves had laid waste to the car. Yeah. By admitting this crucial detail, Wilson and Kelling manipulated Zimbardo's experiment to draw a straight line between one broken window and a thousand broken windows. This enabled them to claim that all it took was a broken window to transform staid Palo Alto into the Bronx, where no one cared. The problem is, it wasn't a broken window that enticed onlookers to join the fray. It was the spectacle of faculty and students destroying an Oldsmobile in the middle of Stanford's campus. Yeah, I was like, that's no, like, (laughs) that's not what did it. Yeah. Yeah. They were like, oh, that professor's fucking up. You want to come fuck up the car? Like, yeah, this seems like it's cool now. Let's do it. Yeah. Like 99% of people, if they, if someone's like, hey, it's actually, there's a car people are fucking up and it's okay. It's perfectly legal. Do you want to fuck up a car a little bit? Most people are going to be like, yeah. I mean, yeah, that seems fun. Yeah. Yeah. But (laughs) yeah, it's, yeah, it's so intuitive. And if I just see like a smashed window on a car, that's not going to make me go, I'm no. going to smash that dude's window, too. I'm going to be like, oh, that fool's backpack got stolen. Like, I'm going to think, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Poor guy. Like, it's not going to yeah. go, oh, nobody I, cares on this street. Speaking as someone who spends a lot of time in the Bay Area, 
I never go to San Francisco and don't see at least one car with a smashed out window. And yeah. I never see all of the windows around that car smashed. In fact, it, it's no. usually in a nice neighborhood still. It's just a yeah. thing they do in San Francisco. They fuck up car windows and steal shit inside cars. Don't yeah. leave stuff in your car in San Francisco. That's, that they don't break lesson. everything. Yeah. Yeah, that was my <laughs> lesson. It was like, yeah. hey, dude, don't leave your backpack in the car. Moral yeah. of the story, don't leave your backpack in the car. Yeah. It yeah. is a meme in San Francisco. Never leave anything in here. And by the way, when I had my car broken into in San Francisco, I was parked directly in front of the Mission Police Precinct. <laughs> um, like, like, and we went in to report it. And the officer said, what do you want us to do about it? <laughs> Right? It's like, it's like, every once okay. in a while. Touche cop. Touche copper. Every so once the, in a while they'll, yeah. nail, they'll nail it. Like there was once yeah. I remember when I was the same like my uh my freaking speakers and amp got stolen out of my car. And it's kind of the same thing. The cop was like, What what you want me to do, man? Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, touche. <laughs> I mean, you know, what You're I want right. you to do is when I talk about police abolition, not be like, who are you going to call if someone robs you? Because yeah. here we are. <laughs> because look at it. I <laughs> and called it's not someone, helping. someone yeah. robbed you, and you just yeah. told me you're not going to do that. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, I first read that article about like the, the how the broken windows policing guys had like fucked up Zimbardo's study years before yeah. I came across like the basics of or years after I'd come across the basics of broken windows policing theory during I, yeah. I took criminal justice for a while in college. I wanted to oh. be in law enforcement at one point um and reading that kind of like dissection of this foundational theory in modern law enforcement was pretty shocking and impactful to me but mm -hmm. i didn't know half the real story until yeah. i read alex vitale's the end of policing this year vitale okay. points out that the core of broken windows theory is the idea that people have latent destructive traits that are unleashed without constant pressure from authority to conform and behave mm. vitale writes quote the emergence of this theory in 1982 is tied to a larger arc of urban neoconservative thinking going back to the 1960s. Wilson's former mentor and collaborator, Edward Banfield, a close associate of neoliberal economist Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, parented many of the ideas that came to make up the new conservative consensus on cities. Banfield's big work was the 1970 book, The Unheavenly City, which is basically an extended argument that poor people, and this is me now, not Vitaly, yeah. The Unheavenly cit City is a, an extended argument that poor people can't be helped, and so welfare programs are a waste of money. Here's a quote from Banfield's book. And this is, again, like the mentor uh, of, of Wilson, the guy who is one of the main architect, one of the two architects of the broken windows theory. So here's what yeah. he writes. Although he has more leisure than almost anyone, the indifference, apathy, if one prefers, of the lower class person oh, is such that he seldom makes even the simplest repairs to the place that he lives in. He is not troubled by dirt or dilapidation, and he does not mind the inadequacy of public facilities such as schools, parks, hospitals, and libraries. Indeed, where such things exist, he may destroy them by carelessness or even by vandalism. Oh my gosh, I'm so yeah. mad right now. Yeah, it makes you uh, real angry, like, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just what, just like, what yeah. do you know about being poor? Yeah, like, go in any poor person's house. Up. They have fixed more of their own shit yes. than you know how to, buddy. Yes, like, <laughs> yes, there's that. I've always put like the like broken window, uh, stop and frisk, and then like kind of the like gang injunctions and street sweepers. Like, I've always kind of like in my head, without any actual research, like lumped them all together under the like, the the theory that you just presented which is the that like ultimately we don't care about our neighborhoods unless we have authoritative powers that keep us in line like i've kind of lumped it under that thought and that that's that's what law enforcement thinks about us you know what i'm saying like that it's still the broken window thing so when I, the gang injunctions, we'll, I don't know if we're, if we're even going to cover that, but like I've always kind of seen them because they were all around. It was all that 80s and 90s like policing that I, I that that turned me into the like policing don't work, you know, yeah. activist that I am now is like under that sort of thinking. I don't know if they all together, but it's but him, the, the statement you just said, the idea of again saying that like ultimately your animals Unless we keep you in line. Yes. It, it just all makes sense now. That's yeah. clearly how you think of us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it will yeah. become clearer where all of, yeah. Yeah. So, 
Uh, Banfield basically thought that cities ought to be abandoned because they were just inherently criminal places. Um, And his protege, Wilson, took a different tact, arguing that cities had been great once and could be halted in their decline and made great again if only the cause of that decline were properly recognized. Wilson identified liberal politicians and, of course, the moral failings of black communities as the chief clause of urban decline. Vitali writes that Wilson, quote, argued that liberals had unwittingly unleashed urban chaos by undermining the formal social control mechanisms that made city living possible. By supporting the more radical demands of the later urban expressions of the civil rights movement, they had so weakened the police, teachers, and other government forces of behavioral Ooh. regulation that chaos came to reign. Wilson, following Banfield, believed strongly that there were profound limits on what the government could do to help the poor. Financial investment in them would be squandered. New services would go unused or be destroyed. They They would continue in their slothful and destructive ways. Since the root of the problem was either an essentially moral or cultural failure or a lack of external controls to regulate inherently destructive human urges, Mm. the solution had to take the form of punitive social control mechanisms to restore order and neighborhood stability. Wilson's views were informed by a borderline racism that emerged as a mix of biological and cultural explanations for the inferiority of poor blacks. Yo. Wilson. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had some yeah. even thoughts like just oh, about yeah. like just, just like just, the the religious right and like yeah. you know you know I'm, I'm I'm I grew up a church boy you know what I'm saying like I still got a, a lot of that stuff still serves me well but like I'm just thinking about like just that like that like white western evangelical like well like okay the breakdown of the family it's like there's no dads in the homes and that's the problem and like in the black community your fathers are missing so y'all have no direction and just hearing all that stuff you know from these people that's supposed to be taking care of your soul like how just how and then when you get get of age and you realize nah i think y'all just racist like when Mm -hmm. it kind of like clicks just the the like crisis of like faith that you have at that moment where you're just like i don't i can't i'm actually not welcome here i thought i was welcome here i'm not welcome here anyway go on Mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh yeah so back to wilson a little bit because this this next part's important no 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 um Wilson co-authored the book Crime and Human Nature with Richard Hernstein, which argued that there were important biological determinants of criminality. While race was not one of the core determinants, language about IQ and body type opened the door to a kind of sociobiology that led Hernstein to co-author the openly racist The Bell Curve with Charles Murray, who was also a close associate of Wilson. So The Bell Curve, if you're not aware, is a thoroughly discredited book about IQ and race that has earned a place of honor on every racist bookshelf. Yes. And so Wilson is friends with both of the authors of that and works on a book with one of the authors of that. Sheesh. This is the guy who co-invents broken windows theory of policing. Like that's <sighs> that's where he's swimming in. That's yeah. his fucking sea. Yeah. And it's so like hearing it all together, it's so clear. Yeah. You know, it's so obvious, you know, coupled with my own just experience and just like, oh my God, it all just hearing it all together, it's just like, yes. The, yeah. N- yes, that's so I'm not crazy. You really do think this about us. Got it. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the broken windows theory gave ideological cover to people who wanted to empower the U.S. police to interfere more directly in the daily lives of more particularly non-white people. Prevention of crime had been the goal since the days of Vollmer, but what that meant had changed. Now poverty and social disorganization were seen as the results of crime, not Mm. the causes. And thus the best way to reform society was to repeatedly punish people for minor criminal behavior. Vitaly goes on. Broken Windows policing is at root a deeply conservative attempt to shift the burden of responsibility for declining living conditions onto the poor themselves and to argue that the solution to all social ills is increasingly aggressive, invasive, and restrictive forms of policing that involve more arrests, more harassment, and ultimately more violence. Wow. So the solution to poverty ain't jobs. No. It's punishment. Yeah, you got to stop them from breaking breaking <laughs> windows st- in their neighborhood by arresting them for weed or whatever. Yeah. Yo, the nuance that like, that like, like snatch that out the sky, the nuance of saying, I'm going to try to say it like you, like, like the quote said, which it was like, like the cause that the cause of crime was not the poverty. The cause of poverty was the crime. And that's the part where I'm just like, 
there's your mistake. There mm-hmm. it is, right? Um, if 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 you've ever heard the term like like a crime of survival, then like you understand what what we talking about here. Where it's just like you you have that completely backwards. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? If if you if you think that the 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 cause of the poverty is the crime, rather than saying the cause of the crime is the poverty. Yeah. That is like that fundamental switch. Everything will start making sense now when you when you understand that like the laws are the crime the law is probably unjust already. So this act of survival shouldn't be a crime in the first place because it's an act of survival, right? But when you understand it as just an act of survival, right? Then the idea of punishing a person for trying to survive seems preposterous because yes. it is. Yes. Yeah. So, um, one example of the violence caused by broken windows policing would be the famous and the the tragic death of Eric Garner. If you've forgotten, yes. um, I know you haven't, but you no. at home. Garner was busted for selling cigarettes illegally. He was choked to death by officers, and his famous cry, I can't breathe, has probably become the most powerful slogan of the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. Um, just kind of sums everything up. Yeah. Uh, you might be surprised to learn that Garner's arrest did not come as the result of like an individual officer just sort of like rolling around the neighborhood and spotting a guy breaking the law and choosing to do something. It was actually ordered by the top brass because the local business owners had complained about Garner's illegal cigarette sales harming their own businesses. So we kind of yeah, harken back to episode two here where we're talking yeah. about like the police are formed to protect. Yeah. Capital. Yeah, and and yeah. it's good for you to point out like what the crime was. It's yes. If you don't know this, it's a Lucy. It's when you just yeah. sell an individual cigarette, which is like yeah. apparently a capital crime now. Yes, yeah. yeah, and is a perfectly normal thing in a lot of the world. Um, Everywhere in the world, like yeah. you, you got ten dollars for a pack of cigarettes, mm-hmm. so you just trying to bum one of them. You gonna walk around and be like, can I bum a cigarette? Or I'll sell you one for a dollar. Like that's yeah. we, this is a the, listen to listen to me, guys. That's a crime. Yeah. That like, is do, a crime. Do you understand how ridiculous that sounds? Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, you go to fucking Bosnia, you order a coffee, you'll get a cigarette with your coffee. But like, yeah, yeah. You, you do that here, you're you're breaking the law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, make cigarettes mandatory. I think is the right the right way to solve this problem. It's it's yeah. easy, right? Yeah. So uh, the NYPD dispatched a sizable force to bust Gar- Garner, a plainclothes unit, and two sergeants with a uniformed backup. And the best case scenario from sending cops after him was that he would be stopped temporarily from selling Lucy's. Eric had a long history of getting busted for petty crimes and going to jail. No sentence had dissuaded him from continuing to do this. Um, so there was no chance of anything happening but temporarily having this guy in jail instead of selling loose cigarettes. That was the best case scenario. Yeah, or just like um, go to a another block like all right yeah this guy don't like me in front of his store i'm just gonna go down the street not really hard nobody <laughs> yeah there was Some no cigarettes man yeah there was n- no way for any meaningful public good to be gained by this no. interaction and yeah. again the pot the worst case scenario which happened is that garner died um, yes which is the- what happened yeah yes now, the NYPD instituted more use of force training for its patrol officers after Garner's death so that the next guy the state sent armed men after for the crime of selling loose cigarettes would be less likely to get murdered. Um, yeah. But that didn't really doesn't really solve anything. As Alex Vitale notes, quote, such training ignores two important factors in Garner's death. The first is the officer's casual disregard for his well-being, ignoring his yeah. cries of I can't breathe, and their seemingly indifferent reaction to his near lifelessness while awaiting an ambulance. This is a problem of values and seems to go to the heart of the claim that for too many police, black lives don't matter. The second is broken window style policing, which targets low level infractions for intensive, invasive and aggressive enforcement. Yeah. Now, the death of Garner caused a flurry of national condemnation of the NYPD and a conflict between the department and Mayor Bill de Blasio. As you'll recall, the NYPD can't strike over this sort of thing, but they were angry that the mayor hadn't enthusiastically backed them when some of their own had committed murder. So they launched a slowdown, which is basically a diet version of a strike. This is what we talked about a little bit earlier. For seven weeks, the New York police only went out in pairs, only left their squad cars if they felt it was absolutely necessary, and they avoided all proactive policing measures. This means that for the first time in decades, the NYPD stopped fucking with people who committed petty crimes and misdemeanors. 
The slowdown ended eventually, but researchers wanted to learn what impact it might have actually had on crime in the city. Their study, published in the nature journal Human Behavior, was based on FOIA comp stat reports from 2013 to 2016. These -hmm. reports include weekly activity for each NYPD precinct for all arrests and criminal activity. The study found that, not surprisingly, the rate of criminal summonses and stop and frisks and arrests had declined massively during the slowdown. This is what you'd expect because cops weren't doing that sort of work. But the researchers also found that civilian complaints of major crimes fell between 3 and 6% during the same period. Civilians reported 43 fewer felony assaults, 40 fewer burglaries, and 40 fewer acts of grand larceny. The drop in violent crime actually continued for several months after the slowdown, leading to an estimated 2,100 fewer major crime complaints. The study authors noted, quote, In their efforts to increase civilian compliance, certain policing tactics may inadvertently contribute to serious criminal activity. The implications for understanding policing in a democratic society should not be understated. The researchers directly addressed broken windows policing and the stop and frisk style public order policing tactics introduced as a result of that theory. Quote, our results imply not only that these tactics fail at their stated objective of reducing major legal violations, but also that the initial deployment of proactive policing can inspire additional crimes that later provide justification for further increasing police stops, summonses, and so forth. So, so, so what you're saying is them not doing what they were doing actually helped. Yeah, if you had a <laughs> DA who came in and said cr- violent crime and like complaints about major crimes by civilians dropped between three and six percent during my tenure, th- you could wa- run for fucking state office, run- yeah. federal office on that shit, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, we'll show you. I'll yeah. show you guys how much you need us. Oh, actually, you are the problem. Yeah. Oh, actually, t- things actually seem a lot better. <laughs> actually, it's fine. You know what? D- d- keep going. Keep slowing down, guys. You know, uh, I-, I-, I wanted a single cigarette the other day. I bought it and nobody got choked. Uh, you know? Yeah. It was fine. Yeah. Everything seems like it's was, actually okay. <laughs> seems like it's actually okay. Dude, y- yeah. Uh, I-, I would love to somehow or another try to invoke just the the empathy and emotions of what like stop and frisk did psychologically you know as a young man you know for, or just just as a person in that sort of context and environment and of course you know obviously that you know bloomberg didn't last in the in the no he it was a joke anyway you know what i'm saying but like um so, so there was no way I could have ever voted for him because I know what psychologically what stop and frisk and like all that yeah. stuff did to us. But like, just, I just think, think about what we're saying here is you can get stopped and searched for nothing for the possibility that you might be doing something. Yeah. So like, it's just so moving about freely you know, I, I I brought up again earlier, like, because the, the L.A. version of that was like the gang injunctions. So if you were if if you and two of your friends happen to be walking home from basketball practice and your clothes kind of match, that's a gang. Right. So no matter what, if there's more than one of you, you're in a gang. So, yep. It, and and there's and there's a there's a there's a gang uptick. So like, it, let's just say you do commit a petty crime, or you were involved with a comedi- with a petty crime. If you were with someone that was either in the um, in the system as a gang member, or it was more than one of you, you can get the gang upcharge. So that just adds five years, right? Even if something only took six, even if it was like a petty crime and it was only like six to eight months probation, if you get the gang uptick, it's five years. Right. So I, I, it was dudes that like disappeared off the streets. I we did until we were in college because of this stuff. It's so they, they came out of prison gangsters. They didn't go in gangsters. They came out, you know, so like I, I, I I'm ranting, but like, like, please understand the psychological like part of that. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, you just yeah. You just like just the the. I mean, I'm a full grown man. I paid freaking property taxes. I'm working on a damn home loan right now, and I still, whenever I just hear that whoop whoop, my body still just kind of like yeah. uh, uh, 
Yeah. Like, that's the fucking thing to me is like, like we talk such a fucking good game in this country about what freedom is. Yeah. And if you live in a country where a huge percentage, if not most, because fucking white people feel this way when they hear the yes. whoop, whoop of the police siren. Yes. Everyone's scared of them. Everyone like, feels it. Yeah. If you've got this unaccountable group of armed people who can fuck up your day and possibly the rest of your life at any moment for no reason, even if you haven't done something wrong and experienced Come no on. consequences, if that's built into your system, you're not free. <laughs> you, yes. <laughs> Whatever nebulous concept freedom is, that's not it. <laughs> it's not it. Yeah. Um, Go back to the script. Yeah. <laughs> or is the script is the script is done. This is this oh. is what we had for today. Um, okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about the Texas Rangers some, which will be fun, and the militarization of police. Uh, we're going to talk about the TV show Cops. Yeah. And that'll be that'll be it for our little series, which is going to leave out just so much stuff, but doing the, doing the best we can over here. Man, I hope, I'm going to say this on record, that like, man, what you've done for the cause by doing this, you and Sophie, like, man, y'all done put, y'all done put stones in slingshots, boy, by like, this is just seven to 10 hours of receipts that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, man, we appreciate this work. I know I'm a part of it, but I appreciate y'all for doing this. I mean, I think it's like, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it came at a certain point, like during covering the protests where like things were starting to die down in part because like people were getting exhausted and in part because the yeah. police got in trouble for all of the violence. And it was like, what's the next thing? to do it's make sure everybody like you want to you want to keep people people have to be angry about this for a long time if it's going yes. to change right this is like yes. this is this is a long fight this yeah. is not going we're not going to like no one's going to like like in order to get one police department taken down in Minneapolis and it hasn't yet happened, but it looks like yeah. it's going to happen. They had yeah. to burn a precinct. <laughs> like it, yeah. it, it, it was hard had to get that far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they fought like, they fought like motherfuckers to, yeah. to take that down. Yeah. Um, and that's just not going to happen nationwide. Yeah. And, but I, we still need to stop this. And the only way to yeah. do that is to get enough people angry long enough that they totally. wear them down. This is not like a, it's not as simple as a vote in better people. And anyone who says that like, okay, well the real way to fix this is vote is lying to you. Voting yeah. is one part of the effort. And the only way voting works is if there is like clearly enough rage and, and yeah. anger and, um and, and activity in the street that it yeah. necessitates action that number one, local governments are scared by the number of people out in the streets and realize like yeah. we're all going to lose our fucking jobs. If we don't do something, there you go. Yeah. Um, and also physically exhausting the police is a part of it. Um, mm -hmm. Running out their fucking budgets is a part of it. Making them realize that they are not making it making it not pleasurable to be an officer because people don't view you positively yeah. is a part of it for all of like all of this is a part of it. Getting rid of cops was, I think, a bigger part of it than a lot of people realize. Yeah. And I, I the, my hope with this is that it it helps keep people angry enough to. S yeah. stay in the fight and make the changes happen there it is. you ever heard of carl von clausewitz no clausewitz was a, a german military he's like a he was a general but he was also like a um like he wrote a lot about strategy he was okay. he's very influential in the field of like thinking about how to to conduct war yeah. and clausewitz had a definition of war that is not all and not not everyone agrees with it but i find it really compelling he defined war as the continuation of politics through other means um Whoa. and Whoa. police have been talking about how there's a war on police for a very long time and i think that the yeah. actual falling number over 40 years you know the number of police officers killed and wounded in the line of duty has continually fallen um, yeah. I don't think it's accurate in like the literal sense, but no. I do think you can look at what the police have been doing and stop and frisk is a big part of it as a war on the people of this country and responding in kind. It's not it's not a sitting in the trenches with a rifle. It's not necessarily even on our side of things. It's not a um, it's not a doing violence to human beings war, but yeah. it's it's not dissimilar from the kind of war that like the Russian government uh, has been attempting to carry out in places like Ukraine and Georgia. Yes. It, 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 it is a it is a very complicated conflict, yes. but it is a yeah. it is a a conflict. Um, yeah. And yeah, I hope that this is it has provided some some additional munitions. Yes, and it has. Good on you.
Well, prop, you want to plug your pluggables before we roll out? I do. This is uh this is prop hip hop over here. Uh, website and Instagram and all those things are prophiphop.com. Um, there's cups and t-shirts and music uh, and other podcasts that I'm a part of. Um, and I am don't have anything else to plug because I'm reliving my teen years yeah. in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Um, yeah. and I am very happy to be a part of this. I am very happy to be here. That's another reference that Sophie will appreciate, but you won't know what I'm talking about. I, I don't. I didn't get that yeah. at all. It's all good. It's but, coming to America, man. Oh, look. shit. Oh, okay. I remember. It's yeah. I, okay. So, this look, is a great movie. Here's, yeah. At some point, Chris, Daniel, whoever doing this, do not cut this part out. At some point, when all this shit is over, Sophie and I, we're going to spend one to two days. At least. And I am just going to indoctrinate you in all of just black culture references, (laughs) urban culture references that you should know. And I just like, and you would appreciate, you know what I'm saying? I'm just like, I need you to know these jokes. I think that's a great idea, actually. Yes. Uh, we can i need i know i need to i've been told for a while i need to watch do the right thing i think that's it correct yeah yeah um and then there's the other there's the one that's about the 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 fucking like the fast food joint or something and like um there's oh, man, a, i don't even know where you're going with okay, so that maybe that's yeah <laughs> wait maybe, so was that yeah you got to do harlem nights you got to watch uh, you got to watch do the right thing. You need to see soul food. You got to see the color purple. You got to see Friday. Yeah, like it's, Friday. there's a lot of, we got to catch you up, man. There's, Cause there's a oh, lot. yeah. And I feel like you'd appreciate all these. Yeah. No, do the right thing is the one that I was thinking about. That's the okay, one at the yes. pizza shop. Yeah. Yeah. The pizza shop. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Do the right okay. thing. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. You need we'll to know who this. radio Raheem is. Yeah. You got to know this stuff. We will do this. All um, right. But first we're going to go away and come back on Thursday Yes. To talk about the police for like another 90 minutes. So buckle buckle up for that, lads and ladies, uh, boyos and non-binarios. I don't, there's not enough good slang yet. It hasn't caught up to it we get, changes yeah. in our cultural conversations. Robert, you could just, we'll, you we'll could just, you could just end the podcast. Just a thought. Podcast. We can end the podcast. All right. It's done. All right. Oh, boy. There's a thread about wanting to hear me rap on the Reddit. That's probably a bad idea. Oh, that's happening, bro. Oh, no. Listen. Behind the Police is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 